Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Now, I'm really excited to see how many of us uh, have gathered here together to be together, to think together, to discuss together both the challenges of and the propositions for the current state of education. Now, as artistic director of Bach, Basis for Aktuelle Kunst here in Utrecht, I have a pleasure to offer a couple of remarks on this day. Also on behalf of my excellent team uh, at Bach, thank you for all your uh, wonderful work. And let me address both the context of this gathering as well as how we envision to structure this day. So a couple of remarks on the context first. This symposium is an extension, as you know, of a research exhibition currently on view at Bach, titled Learning Laboratories, Architecture, Instructional Technology, and the Social Production of Pedagogical Space Around 1970. Now, as, you, as many of you know also, this is the very last weekend of the exhibition. And for those of you who haven't had a chance to visit it, you still can, either today till 9 p.m. or tomorrow, and please, do feel invited and welcome at Buck. The project has been conceptualized by great theorist, writer, and curator Tom Hollert, to whom I will offer this floor just um, in just a minute. It is a part of much longer and larger trajectory of his research on learning uh, laboratories. Um, and the exhibition at Buck is a sort of a snapshot if snapshot is the right uh, tra English translation of the word moment obname in Dutch. In other, wo in other words, it's an insight into a current uh, moment or at this point in time into research that will lead to much larger uh, project, much larger project or perhaps research exhibition at Haus der Kultur der Welt in Berlin, I believe in 2019 or 2020. And as the Haus der Kultur der Welt in Berlin has been uh, our collaborator on a number of projects, I would like to thank for this, uh, for this uh, opportunity once again. And now that I'm at it, our thanks also goes to Harun Faroki Institute uh, in Berlin for this opportunity to present the project in Utrecht. Of course, I would like to thank Tom, Tom Hollert, uh, as well as um, all artists and contributors to this project as much as to the exhibition as to this very day. Now, learning laboratories probes into um, a number of case studies of educational experiments from a variety of geopolitical contexts dating back some five decades. Their conceptualization of pedagogy in programmatic, technological, and spatial terms shaped not just the education of their own time, but also the imaginers of the future of learning and of the world that would accommodate it. I have written in this booklet uh, earlier that speaking from that future, one cannot but wonder where it all has gone wrong, for ours is now rather a reality shaped by the enervating merry-go-round of a results, commodity, client, and profit-driven educational agenda one that succeeded to remodel what once were learning laboratories into an educational industry, which, if it is at all concerned about its pedagogical, ideological, and architectural space, it is at most in the terms of real estate speculation. Now, in spite of such neoliberal transformation, the exhibition carries the creative propositions into the present, borrowing the energy of imagination from the space of art and appealing to it as a resource for instituting otherwise. Now, not only because art can be that the arena of collective thinking and learning and imagining that builds on the legacies in question, but because it has shown, even if only occasionally, that it can reclaim those laboratories from their neoliberal bind, that it can invest in their untried potential among the cracks of the crisis-ridden world, and so into the daily lives of the many. Just a brief reminder, however, if we're thinking through the examples from the 1970s, it is not in order to propose a very simplistic counterpoint to our present reality, for we cannot, we cannot forget that we're looking at the era immersed in the Cold War, 
competition between two versions of modernity in which education, as much as art, science, sports, etc., were terrains of brutal rivalry driven by the dogma of developmentalism. Um, and thus these educational experiments <clears throat> were not only progressive, but also progressivist, technocratic, functionalist, colonial, geared at spreading of Western scientific and culture hegemony. And thus the learning laboratories, in Tom Hollard's words, is not uniquely about the revolutionary concept of pedagogical space, but much more about the very ambivalence of the discourse of pedagogy <coughs> as such. What I have just quoted is from an exchange between Tom and I through um, a number, uh, in a number of conversations, texts, etc. And when Tom and I debated these issues, and I have to say Tom has always very tactfully and elegantly and patiently amended my often unrestrained enthusiasm about the revolutionary 1970s, about the notion of progressive, socially just pedagogies, as I imagined the past. In these times of, uh, in these troubled times, we tend to imagine uh, that the better past is possible because we don't know how to imagine and shape the better future, I think. We both nonetheless concluded that we cannot stop insisting on the notion of the experimental pedagogical space in our fields and beyond it, and that we must continue imagining and enacting the future of learning around it and act, if you will, as if it were possible. When the title of today's symposium, The Real Estate of Education, came out of one of such passionate uh, discussions, we knew on one hand it is a diagnosis of sorts, a diagnosis of the dominant reality in education and universities at present, which at times quite literally own big part of a city and book gigantic profits on their estate, while their main purpose, education and research, are put under austerity regime. Embodying quite clearly what the literary critic and political theorist Frederick Jameson claimed recently in his essay, The Aesthetics of Singularity, namely that, and I quote, in our time, all politics is about real estate. This being a consequence of the dominance of space over time in late capitalism, forming, and I quote again, the lofty statecraft to the most petty maneuvering around local advantage. On the other hand, we see extraordinary mobilization of social movements, not merely against, but importantly, in spite of this regime and in spite of the state of the institutions of education and building in parallel the alternative learning platforms for creating and exchanging knowledge with real relations to social praxis. We see this on the examples such as New University um, in Amsterdam calling for critical university and critical society or University of Color in Amsterdam calling for decolonization of university, both on the level of curriculum and demographics, just two examples, but also importantly in the context of art, where progressive contemporary uh, practices redefine the social fun function of the artist and intellectual by placing learning at the pivot of what I call art as politics of practice of art geared at collective imagining and collective embodying of the question how to be together otherwise, how to institute otherwise, if you will. Something I hope you will agree of critical importance now as the contours of the Trumpesque New World Order become threateningly palpable. In this context of artistic practices and learning, plat uh, learning platforms, I could proudly um, cite um, the New World Academy, a learning platform co-founded by artist Jonas Stahl and back in 2013, and operated over, which operated over the course of the last couple of years as a platform in which progressive social and political movements gather together with artists, students, scholars, activists, etc., to deliberate on the role of art in the midst or at the core of social struggles, like, for example, with the refugees in Limbo, the Pirate Party International, or the Kurdish Women Movement, among others. These, in brief, are the lines of thought uh, that I believe will, to a great extent, form an understructure to start off our conversation today. As for the organization 
of the day. I believe you all have received folders with program and other useful uh, information that will help you navigate throughout uh, this day. Um, as you know, you have read or heard, we have invited writer and theorist Tom van der Putte and artist and lecturer Annette Kraus to shape and set up two independent panels, one this morning, another one in the afternoon, to engage in contemporary reading of the propositions articulated in the exhibition learning uh, laboratories. We will be introducing uh, the panels as we progress throughout the day. For now, thank you, Tom and Annette, for um, um, your great work and for bring, bringing um, together such remar uh, remarkable speakers. We all are greatly looking forward uh, to these discussions. Following these two panels, art historian and sociologist Pelin Tan, um, welcome to Utrecht, Pelin, somewhere here in the, before me, in the audience, uh, who will offer some complimentary notes on the subject. And um, 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 after that, um, I hope we will have ample time together uh, to continue the conversation and pl plenary discussion. In closing, as many of you know, we have been moving the venue of this symposium to bigger and bigger rooms across the city in sync with your growing interest. As Buck is, many of you know, very tiny and modest place, a way perhaps of refusing to take part in that real estate conundrum of neoliberal capitalism that we are discussing today. This, however, places a number of challenges before us. For at back, we are torn between what we articulated as two key imperatives that motivate our work when organizing public assemblies like this. One necessitates the question, how to keep a gathering like this small so that it becomes a true learning place, not just to keep the conversation intimate, but to make sure it remains complex. The other, necessitates the question, how to make a gathering like this big? So that a real force can form around the desire to collectively change the circumstances within which we labor. It is from within this dilemma that I wish all of us here a good working day in achieving, in striking a balance between the complexity of the task before us and the critical question we must take seriously in the times like ours, namely, how or oh how can we be more? Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks, everyone, at uh, uh, Buck um, for making this possible, for making the exhibition uh, possible and uh, to be uh, such great interlocutors throughout the entire process. I also like to thank, as Maria did already, uh, the Haus der Kulturnerwelt and uh, my uh, comrades at uh, Harun Faroki Institute. Um, and I also like to thank uh, you, the audience, that you <laughs> That you all that you uh, um, that you came and that you uh, show that much of an interest in <clears throat> in the issues uh, in the issues proposed uh, today, uh, I will um, I will somehow act as a as an MC or uh, master of ceremony, <laughs> um, uh, uh, presenting introducing um, um, the panels and uh, later on. So I will. So, uh, so I'll spare this right now, the introduction of, um, of the conveners of the panel particularly, and of Perlin Tan. And I will start right away with a short, um, uh, with a short talk that uh, is trying to address a couple of questions and delve, um, that, that have been rise, raised already and that have been raised by the exhibition. And, we'll, and I would like also to delve at somewhat deeper into uh, other questions that haven't been touched on, touched upon in, in the show. Uh, to conceive and to uh, organize this symposium had and has many reasons, some of which uh, became, Maria already mentioned, that uh, dramatically more urgent 
over the weeks and months that passed since we started to think about the possibility and the necessity to organize such an event. The current onslaught of right-wing populism, for the lack of a better term, to capture the highly diverse vectors behind the series of authoritarian coups around the world, not only is challenging, not only is a challenging phenomenon in the political arena to be critically scrutinized and contested, but a real, viscerally real, destructive, violent fact that not only threatens but actually hurts and kills. The educational pedagogical response to this cannot remain limited to the institutions in charge of education. A broader sense of educational politics is required, one that calls for the uh, public institutions' responsibility to react while providing at the same time safe spaces, literally safe, protectable spaces, that is, protectable against the physical and psychic in intrusion by racist, misogynist, homophobic voices and bodies. As much as extramural, anti- and para-institutional grassroots organizing is necessary now, it seems equally necessary to support and defend the public civic institutions and those funded with public money in a qualified way. They should provide the infrastructures and the safety to facilitate the development of the very skills, knowledges, and solidarities required to shape a critical, egalitarian, radically democratic, internationalist agenda to dissolve the imminent threat. Partially, the urgencies that catalyzed and framed the symposium are related to the exhibition, Learning Laboratories, and uh, Bucks Instituting Otherwise program in, in which it takes place. However, the exhibition is always meant to be a research tool, a modest research tool, to develop strategies to think a particular historical and decidedly global moment of the intersection of architecture, education, and politics, namely the 60s, 1960s, and 1970s, or the long 1960s. Thus, Learning Laboratories is a modestly scaled, albeit ambitious, investigative archival project, a collection of case studies composed to suggest the outline of a translocal and transtemporal historical narrative, a project that is to be regarded as a contribution to a much larger discussion, or rather, struggle. This discussion, this struggle, of which today's symposium is supposed to be a part of, does not stop at the boundaries of the academic disciplines directly addressed in and by the exhibition, such as architectural history, educational history, <clears throat> political history. It does not stop either at the historical determinants of educational reform in the Cold War era and the radicalization of education around 1968. And it does not even stop at the boundaries of contemporary art practices that are informing the exhibition considerably. The discussion, the struggle in which today's symposium arguably is about to participate concerns the ways in which education, economy, politics, art and architecture currently interact and intersect and, and the question to which extent the state of education today is in fact a real estate. What is the reality of education? What is its real? What is the state's investment and interest in education? What is the position, condition, health, or legal status of education to draw from the etymology of the term estate? What is the role, function, and visibility of estate that is of social status, of class, within contemporary educational structures? The panels will address questions of this nature and more. The histories of alternative, radical, free, and counter-education and their connectability with contemporary contestations of prevailing realities in education where market-driven, managerialized, individualizing, segregating, and increasingly elitist models are favored. Moreover, the panelists will address the currency of the educational in the field of contemporary art will be, uh, uh, and, will, and how this connects uh, with issues of feminist and decolonial theory and practice. They are going to speak about the upsurge of racism and the construction of racialist subject, subjects. The notion of a knowledge produced in migration and the autonomy of such knowledge will probably become a theme of debate, as will the project and prospect of radical education 
that engenders and empowers translocal networks of activists, artists, and knowledge workers. For the remaining time of this introdu introduction, however, I'd like to direct your attention to the term real estate in the title of the symposium. The long-term research and curatorial project on the politics, or rather biopolitics, of learning environments of which the exhibition at Buck embodies an early stage, seeks to investigate the genealogies of the material and, in, and immaterial, the actual and the virtual spaces of knowledge work, of learning and teaching. The subjectivation that is supposed to be shaped and programmed by educational environments was once conceived as the so socialization in the ideal community of academia, of academia. The campus of the post-war university was designed in analogy to, futures, to a future society imagined by educators, architects, planners, etc. The thriving of academic communality was to be facilitated by an architecture allowing for informal encounters, meetings, exchange. The architecture was supposed to be meaningful in this community building respect. If it didn't serve this purpose, or if the community turned out to be delusional, or if it hadn't replaced the, the historical buildings, architecture, real estate could turn into the target of appropriation and occupation of squatting by their users. The becoming of an academic educational community could be elicited through claiming for itself the architecture, the physical environment of study, in the course of the fight for the realization of the idea of an alternative campus sociality. The photograph on the left shows a sit-in in the, at the Ashton Webb Building at the University of Birmingham in November, December 1968, a rather peaceful takeover elicited by debate over student participation in the university's government that however made a deep impression not least on Stuart Hall and his colleagues uh, of the Birmingham Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies. The image on the right-hand side has been taken during the occupation of Senate House at the University of Liverpool in March 1970. Here, the issues of real estate and racism became entangled in quite literal a fashion. On the one hand, the protests centered on the university's links with the apartheid regime in South Africa and called for the chancellor, Lord Salisbury, notorious for his racist views, to resign. Another cause for action was the appearance of an expose of the university as the owner of slum housing in which families experienced a dreadful living conditions. That has brought tenants and students together to protest at the official opening by Princess Alexandra of the new Senate House in May 1968, 1969. The protest and the anger about the double standards that the university applied to real estate and other issues led to growing tensions between students and the university authorities. These tensions came to a head with the 11 days occupation of Senate House in March 1970. The four demands issued by the protesters addressed the racist attitudes of the Chancellor as well as the financial and real estate transactions by the university authorities. Administration was pressed to call for the Chancellor's immediate resignation and to make transparent to the public all university investments. Moreover, an independent public in inquiry should be held into the methods used at all university levels for keeping data and information on staff and students. And nobody taking part in the occupation should be victimized. However, the disciplinary hearings of April 12, 1970 resulted in nine students being suspended and one expelled. To provide just one more example out of the many that can be traced in the archive of the larger 1968 uh, moment. On February 13, 1969 at 8 a.m., a group of around 60 African-American students stormed the Allen Building, the administrative hub on Duke University's campus in Durham, North Carolina. This takeover happened in a moment when anger and frustration about the reluctance of the university authorities to implement a black studies program and the general marginalization of African-American students on the campus has reached a climax. 
The black protesters released the staff and occupied the central records room, threatening to burn the records if the administration attempts to, re to remove them by force. The records room in the center here of the, uh, of the building. An hour after occupying the building, the students issued a list of 11 demands which stated changes such as, I quote, the immediate end to police harassment uh, of black students, the right to establish a black dorm on campus, financial assurance for black students, and the reinstatement of black students who were forced to leave Duke due to the stifling social and educational environment. After about seven hours of negotiations, the protesters cleared the building in the late afternoon of the same day, after which local and state police stormed and filled the building surroundings with tear gas. Before, a crowd of some thousand white students white student supporters had surrounded the building to create a barricade for the students inside. Inevitably, they clashed with the police, which sparked the so-called Duke riots. Thus, the takeover acted as a catalyst for the white students to join black students in their fight for change. Immediately after the end of the takeover, students started to organize and inform about the event's consequences and the tactics to be used to not obey to the university's administration. Boycott and strike were called for here on the, on the left. Another pamphlet here on the right urged students to refuse uh, filling out a questionnaire on the crisis uh, by the authorities. Moreover, student activists campaigned for the introduction of a black studies program, organized lectures and seminars, as well as a torchlight parade on the issue here to the right. Here is a flyer from March 1969 asking for support of the Malcolm X University of Liberation. This free and experimental school of black studies was founded at the occasion of the Allen's Buildings occupation. For a few hours, the physical building of the Duke's university's administ administration had become the host, the shell, the incubator of an anti-racist militant black power school. This school would actually start operating later that same year in 1969 uh, outside of Duke's campus in the city of Durham. For a little more than three years, always under financial constraints, the school offered a program based on the concepts of black power and pan-Africanism that would include travels of students and faculty to, to Africa. Its stated aim was to train, I quote, food scientists, tailors, architects, engineers, medics, cadre leaders, communications technicians, physical developers, teachers, black, ex black expressionists, administrators, and linguists. And many of the students uh, that, that were part of the Allen Buildings occupation on the campus uh, uh, moved to this school for, for quite some time, but uh, also removed back to the Duke's um, uh, uh, main campus. So there was, a, in a way, uh, an exchange uh, going on between the official studies at the university and this uh, independent uh, self-organized studies at the Liberation University. This, this act of instituting otherwise moved the African-American students from the margins of the campus society to its center and then again outside. Occupying the administration building, or more particularly the university's memory, its archive, uh, and in the following days and weeks, uh, the roads of the campus and the streets of Durham with manifestations of the newly founded uh, Malcolm X Liberation School was a fierce act of decolonizing knowledge and knowledge production, which obviously won over the sympathy of many white students who felt that the administration should cater to the demands of all students at the university. What I find particularly interesting the, here is the activation of the Allen Building through its re repurposing, how it became an actor in the struggle for equal rights and non-racialized view of the university's community. Through, through occupying the built space, a different relation to the spatial, to the spatial order was made possible, which, is, which extended over the actual time of the physical occupation of the space. It also reminded other students on the campus of the unfulfilled promise of the academic community. Through the takeover of the Allen Building, the founding of a school within the school of an alternative model of schooling 
based on the interests and needs of a racialized, marginal, marginalized segment of the campus population was made palpable. Models of such activating repurposing of academic architecture were legion at the time. The occupation of the main building at Columbia University in New York in May 1968 lasted six weeks. The performative resignification re of a campus building by student protesters through occupation produced realities and images of a worldwide contestation, not only of the educational institutions and their politics, but also of a lift architectural criticism. Such usually implicit criticism could provoke massive violence in response. On January 18, 1969, the main building of the University of Tokyo was seized and stormed by police uh, deploying water cannons after an occupation that contested Japan's involvement in the war in Vietnam and the government's relation to the United States, an occupation that almost lasted, lasted one year. On April 19, 1969, three months after the Battle of Tokyo and two months after the Duke occupation, students, mainly African-American, occupied Willard Strait Hall, the Students' Union Building at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, as a continuing form of protesting the university's racist attitudes and irrelevant curriculum. The 36 hours takeover received national attention as thousands of students became involved, which engaged the community in broad discussions about racial relations and educational matters. Though the image of the students' occupiers leaving the building with guns dominates the memory of the takeover, it needs to be recalled that the guns were introduced during the seizure of a building only after groups of white students had attacked the black students occupying the building. At the very time when seemingly emancipative notions such as open plan and flexible space were being promoted in discourses of educational and architectural planning, the material reality of educational space became an increasingly contestable fact. The modernist and late modernist notion of the free-ranging, self-learning individual that thrives in an environment of choice and interaction, of informality and play, to be seen here, was contradicted by sturdy authoritarianism and architectural blockage, blockage in contexts that took the functionalism of all things modern for granted, but didn't have much of a plan other than brute military force how to accommodate more radical movements on the campus. As everyone here will be aware, occupying school and university buildings, not to speak of occupying squares and parks, prevailed throughout the past eight years or so as a mode and model of civil and student but also faculty protest. This new wave of occupations of academic buildings started around 2009. Maria already mentioned the, uh, new, the new, new university here in uh, Amsterdam. Um, when discussion about financial cuts, tuition fees, and more generally the commodification of education and neoliberal managerialism led to public outcries that were strategically channeled into the, repeat, into the repeated seizing of architecture. Here to the left you see the, uh, the first day of the occupation of the uh, main hall in, uh, in Vienna, of the, in, in the Academy of the Fine Arts, where a lot of the occupation of university spaces uh, started in um, uh, 2009, here on the right. Uh, an image that you probably know all too well. And not by accident, but due to its role as one of the potentially most important financial assets of the school, the subject of real estate has become the reason and the ground of many such occupations. The financial value of prestigious urban locations, for instance, the possibility to speculate on the real estate market with the property, the land owned by universities, has resulted in often disastrous situations. In 2013, the 65 days occupation of the dean's office at the top floor of the main building of Cooper Union, the prestigious art school in Manhattan, not least known for the free of charge study it offers, was elicited by the announcement to introduce tuition fees, which again was, uh, was largely caused by real estate related financial mismanagement of the school's administration. Not only had it commissioned an expensive new building completed in 2009 and designed by architect Thom Main of Morphodis, it also created deep losses in the value of the school's one and only asset, 
the piece of land on which Manhattan's Chrysler building is standing. So here we have the case of an art school founded in the early 20th century with the help of an endowment that consists of real estate, land, to be used as a pledge in the risky financial transactions, transactions that threaten a tuition-free education that had been based, ironically, for a century on real estate rent. The response by student activists of Free Copper Union seems only too understandable. We are done with this building, may be read as a call to face and fight the real estate of education by demonstrating a methodological disdain for the self-aggrandizing gestures, gestures of university administrations that have long turned into subdivisions of the financial industry. Turning one's back on the prestige gathering valorizations of property and ranking free education over depth inflecting studies in a signature building could prove the right political stance for those working and studying in the learning environments of the current moment. Another recent example of how real estate speculation can affect the quality and even the very availability of education is the CAS, the Sir John Cass School of Art, Architecture and Design, a multidisciplinary design school integrated in the obviously severely mismanaged London Metropolitan University. The school, sometimes called Oldgate Bauhaus, has a main building in an increasingly demanded and therefore expensive part of East London that shall be put on the market to be sold for an estimated amount of uh, 50, 50 million pounds. After the Oldgate building is sold, the entire school is supposed to move to LMU's main Holloway campus in Islington in North London. But facilities there are much smaller and less appropriate for the kind of multidisciplinary study that has been established in Oldgate. Moreover, the CAS administration has announced a cut of student places of around 15%. In response to these plans, students and faculty occupied the building in December 2015 and produced visual protests, such as this one, where protesters stood in the windows of the CAS central house, signaling their determination to stay in the building. As a student put it in her video, a love letter to my art school, I quote, we have too much stuff and take up too much space, and apparently being an artist or a craft isn't enough to survive in this university. This comment resonates with an article written by critic Dean Canning in the response to the occupation of the Slade School of Fine Art in London and the discourse around occupation of London universities and their art schools in the winter of 2010. Canning emphasized the value of, I quote, the physical space offered at art college. In educational terms, studio space being precisely something which from a marketing outlook becomes a quantified commodity and is therefore under threat from more resource efficient um, courses. So a declaration of what is precious becomes simultaneously a new use of space as a communal forum rather than something to be individually allotted or fought over. The profound change that occurred during the occupation mirroring the, the more general mood of the historic moment was the shift from the individual to the collective signaled by the proliferating use of the word we, an inspiring transformation in an environment that prizes individualized development and the authorship of isolated works. Space, the quality of space is important to education, certainly not only for art students. In Zurich at the ZHDK, the Zurich University of the Arts, the new imposing building, privately owned building, in a former industrial area of the city, the Tony Areal, opened in 2014 but was received with less approval by the students than some may have expected. In the summer of 2016, the discontent of many led to a clandestine graffiti action, graffiti action in the seventh floor of the building. Spraying on the white walls expressed the unease and anger felt by the students with regard to spaces perceived as inhospitable, controlled, and clinical. In April 2016, the school had defined a system of zones by areas that can be used for painterly, performative, or other forms of expression, which are distinguished from those areas where none such thing would be permitted. However, information about the policing of space only leaked after a wall newspaper was removed from a prohibited zone. In the poster, a student had criticized the restructuration of a study program of the school. Overnight, the seventh floor of the building was covered with graffiti, 
before the administration could paint them over. However, the same students, or maybe the same students, the same people in another clandestine action covered the graffiti with white paint. From the beginning, dissent over the zoning policy of the school had been overshadowed by strong repugnance of, repugnance of what is perceived as an authoritarian neoliberalism prevailing uh, the school politics. One of the graffiti was particularly explicit in naming the subject of contestation. It read, the very democratization of academic structures after 1968 is being revoked instead of autonomy and participation in decision making, a pseudo transparent system of top down enforcement is being put in place. I guess, I guess this a statement handwritten inscribed on the institution's wall quite nicely sums up what might be at stake in the real estate of education. Thank you. Thank you.